prayer. Give me one second, let me get it all set up. Okay. All right, Brother Albert, if you come over here and just right there, but everybody should be able to hear you there. Okay. Please, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. It's a pleasure to come before you. It's a pleasure for us to come and receive from you. As your children, oh Lord, we've come to feed from you. Father, oh Lord, it is our heart desire that even as we come to feed from you always, we will abide strongly within you. We will focus within you. Father, oh Lord, we will grow stronger in you, in Jesus' name. Father, oh Lord, with all our needs, with all that we have in us, Father, oh Lord, let us feed from your word, oh Lord. Let your word heal us. Let your word revive us. Let your word keep us going. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank you for this and many more that you always do and will do for us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Albert. Okay, they probably could have heard on the mic. But I didn't hear a word. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the problem is, is Albert is a nice guy and he has a soft voice, unlike me, yes, who, who's, who, who's mean and loud. And I spit, so I don't use a mic in, in the auditorium. Uh, wait, I am Mike. So I, I, I guess I am the auditorium. So uh, we're, we're looking, of course, at the book of Galatians. Uh, we're getting just some general introductory material as we begin, um, because I, I feel it's important for us to understand that. Uh, as Brother Bill has often said, the Bible wasn't written to us. It was written to Middle Easterners or Middle Easterners with their understanding. And so my job is to help us think more like them so that we can understand what they understood when they read the Word of God. So I gave you a set of charts last week, and I'm just going to simply flash through them to remind you of those charts. I gave you a chart in the canonical order of the Bible uh, that uh, showed you kind of when um, Galatians was written, and remember, we're looking at, at Galatians. I uh, gave you a chart on the general uh, outline of the New Testament that shows you that the book of Galatians comes under Paul's journey letters. So these are, these are Paul's journey letters. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, because it's important for us to understand the exact setting, I think, of the book of Galatians. And then I, get, I gave you one. I, uh, I know last week I missed one chart for you. Then I gave you a chart on the progressive editions of Paul's epistles to the and of the New Testament that kind of showed you where it fit as far as the order of writing goes. It's one of the first ones. And then we also talked about the general purpose for the book uh, with one of the charts, and that, that was uh, what we call so, uh, uh, soteriology, which is the study of salvation and how people are saved. And, and so then I gave you some introductory material last week. Uh, if you're flipping through your charts, uh, you should have the Paul's life and conversion is one of the ones that you should have. We talked about his early uh, life as a as a Jewish follower. Uh, somebody remind me of where was he born? Tarsus, okay. And uh, where was he brought up? In Jerusalem. Who who was his teacher? Gamaliel. All right. So so Gamaliel was his teacher. So so he was as Jewish as Jewish could be, wasn't he? Uh, you couldn't really be any more Jewish than he was, um, because even though he was a Roman citizen by birth. He was Jewish by upbringing and by nationality. And so, so we talked about the fact that he also persecuted Christians. We talked about the fact that then God appeared to him on the road to Damascus, and we talked a little bit about that. And then uh, God sent Ananias to talk to Paul and convert Paul. And so this is kind of where we're at now. And the, the ones that you should have now, if you, if you have the ones, if, if you have the charts I gave you last week, I gave you uh, two new pages today, and those are the ones we're going to cover today, and those fit right, right in there in your stack. Uh, I, I didn't number these by pages, or else it would have been easier because, you know, I can't do things easy. Um, but uh, one of the things that we noticed last week was we noticed kind of why it was that God would pick Paul or the individual to write these, to, to write the book of Galatians, especially when you think of Galatians being the way people are saved that God chose Paul out of all the apostles. Uh, and so therefore, because of that, there's some yeah. apparent charges as we, as we get into the book of Galatians that the Galatian book seems to imply that Paul is trying to correct. And so as he's writing his letter to the Galatians, he's correct, correcting some of their, some of their attitudes and, and some of their thinking. And so we want to talk a little bit about those today as you get in the book because it'll help you when you get ready to read the book and when you go through the book. And by the way, I hope you read the book every week. 
I'd like you to just read through Galatians every week so you're familiar with it as we begin to talk about it. And, and one, of the, one of the main things that they would say about Paul, these Judaizing teachers. Now, a Judaizing teacher is what? Somebody tell me what a Judaizing teacher is. Is that just a religious word we use to kind of impress people that don't know what don't know the Bible? What's a Judaizing teacher? He, he teaches the Old Testament as Jewish law, especially uh, as interpreted during Jesus' day here by the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the those individuals and the scribes. They had a different way of looking at the Old Testament rather than what God wanted the Old Testament to be viewed. And so if you turn with me to Galatians chapter 1, I want you to notice real quick just a little phrase in here. We are in the book of Galatians, so you might have your Bible open up to that uh, as we take a look at this. But in Galatians chapter, chapter 1, and down here as Paul is, is writing his letter, uh, And uh, as he's writing in his letter, uh, he tells them when, when it comes to the idea of the way the, view, the Jews view the, the word of God is if you come down here to, you find it real quick, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13. Galatians 1 13 says, for you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism. Notice that he doesn't say Old Testament teaching. He says Judaism, or he doesn't say the scriptures. He says Judaism. Judaism is something different than just the Old Testament, okay? He says, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism. He didn't say I was advancing in the scriptures or in the Old Testament. He says I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen being more exceeding, extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. So Judaism is the teaching of the ancestral traditions that had been taught, that had been passed down hand over hand over hand. And if you remember when Jesus was talking on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus used the statement, you have heard that it was said, right? He used that constantly in, in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit murder. You've heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And he's not quoting the Old Testament when he says that. He's quoting the Jewish tradition. And that's why he doesn't say it is written. Because whenever Jesus quoted the Old, the Old Testament, he never said, you heard it said. He would say, the scriptures say, or the prophets say, or the word of God says, but in the Sermon on the Mount, he doesn't say that. He says, you have heard that it was said, because he's referring to the Jewish traditions on how they viewed those scriptures. For example, with the idea of, of murder, their idea was, as long as I don't actually throw the rock and, and hit Angie on the top of the head and kill her, then I'm okay. I'll pay Chad to do it. And so Chad can do it, uh, and, and I'm okay, even though I paid him, because I'm not the one who did it. That's the way they interpreted you know, you shall not commit murder. And that's why Jesus says, no, no, no. What the scripture says is you're not supposed to hate anybody. So it doesn't matter if I'm the guy who actually hits him or if I'm the person who pays to have it done, or if I just hate him in my heart, then I've committed murder. And that's what God's word says. But Jewish tradition taught them that you just, you know, you had to actually do the one that hit him on the head or that you're the one that had to strike him. And, you know, you could hate people as long as you didn't do that to them. And so I hope you understand the difference between Judaism and the Old Testament. As I talk about it, I don't want you to think that I'm talking bad about the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the Bible tells us, is good. In Romans chapter 7, he says the law was good. The law was good for what it was designed for. It was good. God didn't make a mistake when he gave him the Old Testament law. It's not like God says, well, I know they're not going to be able to do it, so I'm going to give it to them to prove to them they can't do it. And like if God's, you know, some angry God up there. No, the, the problem is, is that when we're talking about Judaizing teachers, we're talking about these individuals that have interpreted the, the Old Testament law in such a way that it actually is against what God was trying to teach them. And so the Judaizing teachers, those people that hold the traditions that were passed down year after year after year and were recorded in the Mishnah and the Talmud. And those are commentaries that the Jewish rabbis would write. And it's kind of like us 
Sometimes in our camp, we say, well, I, you know, I, need, to read, I read, need to read the commentaries that our brethren write. They're, they're the only ones I should read. And so what happens is, is then we get that perspective and that's the only perspective we get. Instead of trying to figure out what God actually says and not being overly concerned about whether my church says it or some other church says it or whether, you know, I'm finding this out from some preacher or, you know, somebody else. What matters to us is what does the word of God say? Not, not am I staying true to some traditions? And so that's what you need to understand when we talk about Jewish Judaism. Okay, it's not they're following the Old Testament and Paul you know, is trying to get rid of them or, uh, and because that's not what's going on. So the reason I say, say all that is because the Judaizing teachers, those people who are hold of the traditions of the, of the elders, Paul is teaching something entirely different. And so therefore they're looking at Paul as if Paul is not really a well-educated, well-informed Jewish person, even though he was brought up where? In Jerusalem, by who? Gamaliel, who was the doctor of the law during that time, he, he, was, the, he was the Yale of, of, Christ, of, of Jewish religion in that day and time, okay? Brother Leroy? Yeah. He was teaching, he was teaching Judaism. He was teaching the tradition of the elders and all those things. Remember, remember when they accused Jesus' disciples of not keeping the tradition of the elders because they didn't wash their hands? That's Judaism. Okay, so the book of Galatians is not against the Old Testament. The book of Galatians is against Judaizing teachers. The Old Testament he's going to talk about in the book of Galatians is supposed to help us come to Jesus. That's what the Old Testament is for. It's supposed to help us see God and come to him. Uh, all right, so one of the things that they say, therefore, is they say that Jesus is not a, a genuine, true apostle. And, and for example... Uh, in, Gal in Galatians chapter 1, I just want you to notice a couple of things. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1, he says, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of, men, of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Did you notice how he starts his book? He, didn't, he doesn't start his book saying, oh, you guys know me. No, he says, look, let me tell you who I am. I am an apostle. I've been called by God, and Jesus called me. That's who I am, okay? Now, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul writes to them, he says, Paul, call an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. So I'm just showing you a couple of examples where the Judaizing teachers, one of the things that they charge against Paul is don't listen to him because he's really not an apostle. Now, why would they say he's really not an apostle? Because he wasn't one of the original 12. If you go, if you go over with me to Luke chapter 6, and you come over to Luke chapter 6, where Jesus is picking his apostles, Okay, and he, uh, we can start off oh, around verse uh, 12. Uh, Luke 6, 12 says, It was at this time that he sent off, to, uh, he's, uh, sorry, it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples, there was a bunch of disciples, to himself and chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles. So what's the word apostles mean? Sent. Sent. Okay, the word apostle just means sent. It's not a religious word. It's not, it's not a word that's simply used in the, in the Bible, and that's the only place you find it. It, it was a word that just meant sent. You're, you're sent. So you had people that could be sent by their mothers to the grocery store. You had, you had bosses that could send their slaves somewhere. That individual was an apostle, but he wasn't an apostle of Christ. And so even though there's individuals today who run around claiming to be apostles, we really have to ask the question, did, the, did God really send them? Did God really call them? Or are they just like a, a preacher that's just running around talking to people about God? Because there's a difference. And, and so he wasn't one of the originals. Verse 14 says, Simon, whom he also called Peter and Andrew, his brother and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and 
Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the, uh, who was also called the Zealot, Judas, uh, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And so he lists the 12. You, you hear Paul in there? No. So, so that's one of the reasons why they, they, didn't, they didn't recognize Paul as an apostle. And not only that, but when they got ready to appoint an apostle in order to take whose place? Judas's place. If you come over to Acts chapter 1, there's this whole section that deals with the qualifications for an apostle. And, and these, this is still true for us today. If somebody claims they want to be a, an apostle, here's what they have to uh, have experienced. In, uh, in Acts chapter 1, and down here at verse 15, it says, and remember, this is at, Acts here is happening right here after Jesus, after Jesus died and rose and went up to heaven. But before the Holy Spirit came, this is Acts chapter 1, okay? Acts chapter 2 starts after Jesus sends the Holy Spirit down. So we're in, in the place where Jesus is up in heaven, but he hasn't sent down the Holy Spirit yet, okay? And, and so it says in verse 15 of Acts 1, it says, At this time Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 persons uh, was there together, and said... Brethren, the scripture uh, had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who, uh, who arrested Jesus. For he was accounted among us and received his share in this ministry. Now I'm going to skip down here to verse 21. He says, therefore, it is necessary that, that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that Jesus went in and out among us, Beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So what are the qualifications? You had, you had to be with Jesus from the time he began his ministry, to the time he died, and you had to be a witness of his resurrection. So can I be an apostle? No. Now, I can be an apostle of the Macro Church of Christ. You guys can send me to Cuba. You can send me to... To, to Central America, you can send me to go preach, but I'm not Jesus's apostle. Even though I might be doing work for Jesus, he's not the one who personally sent me. Now verse uh, 23 says, so they put forward two men, J Joseph called uh, Barsabas, who was also called Justice and, Math and uh, Matthias. And they prayed and said, you Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his, to his own place. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was uh, added to the 11 apostles. So there you have 11 apostles as, as the Holy Spirit is going to come down in Acts chapter 2. You once again have the complete number that represents God's people, that number 12. By the way, how many tribes were there of Israel in the Old Testament? 12. 12. That's, that's always been the number that represents God's people. So that's the reason why the, the, the Jewish community didn't regard Paul as a true apostle, because he wasn't mentioned there, okay? He, he wasn't one of the individuals that, that uh, Jesus actually physically, personally called, okay? But you have to understand that Paul says he was called. Now, we've already gone over it, but in Acts chapter 9, what happened with Paul? He saw the light. Where was he going? What was he going to go do there? He was, going, he was going to Damascus to kill Christians because he was a Judaizer. He was somebody who was keep, trying to keep the Old Testament according to their tradition. And therefore, he wasn't uh, somebody who was um, in agreement with what was going on with Christians. As a matter of fact, he was trying to put them to death because they were following a false god, right? Which is what you're supposed to do. If you were a Jew during that time and you followed a false god, they were supposed to take you out and stone you. So that's what Paul was doing, okay? And then what happened on the road to Damascus, rather than us reading it since we already went over it? All right. All right. So Jesus appeared to him in a light. 
and there were other people around. By the way, was was uh, did anybody else see this light? Is this kind of like Joseph Smith and Muhammad uh, when they received revelation from those the angels that they said they received? Anybody anybody see them? They they saw the light. Well, they heard the voice. They didn't understand the voice. Yeah. So so there were witnesses to the actual experience that was going on. Remember remember the Bible is said in history. The Bible is not a myth. Like nobody knows if the if an angel appeared to Joseph Smith, nobody knows if the prophet uh, uh, Muhammad appeared to to uh, uh, or or uh, uh, Muhammad was a prophet that that you know received his message from angels. We don't know. There's no there's no witnesses to that stuff, but there were witnesses to this. So it's said in history. The he sees the light, and what happens? Anybody know how long he was blinded? Three, three days. Three days. It's interesting that three in the Bible represents God's number. So it's like God saying, hey, you were blind from seeing me. And by the way, that's what Judaism does to people. It keeps them from seeing the truth. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, it says that there's a veil over the face of Jewish people when they still read the law, when they when they read the Old Testament law, they can't see Jesus because there's that veil over their face that's under consideration. Uh, okay, so uh, anyway, so he sees the light, right? And and uh, what does Jesus tell him to do? Go to the street, call straight, and wait for Ananias, who's going to come and tell you what you have to do. And what did Ananias tell him he had to do? Well, he had to be baptized. He, and so Ananias took him out and baptized him, right? Okay, so the, so the Lord appeared to him, and Paul says that the Lord actually called him. And certainly, it sure seems like the Lord called him uh, from there, because he told, oh, by the way, uh, back to Acts 9 real quick. Let me just re remind you of this that when God was talking to Ananias, he said to Ananias, uh, over here in verse 13 of Acts 9, he said, but Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. So what did God tell Ananias that Paul's job was going to be? To take the gospel to the Gentiles and also to Israel, but to, but to the Gentiles. And so he was being called by God. He says, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So even Ananias knew that God was calling Paul. It wasn't just he was converted and became a Christian. God was calling Paul to a specific task that he was supposed to do. Uh, now, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, or sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, as Paul is writing the Corinthian letter, his credibility again becomes questioned. And so he's writing the book with some to individuals to help them understand uh, that he really is an apostle. And so as he, as he writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, and down here, verse 11, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 11 says, I have become foolish. You yourselves compelled me. In other words, he, he had been, he'd been boasting about what he was doing. He says, actually, I should, I should have been commended by you, for in no respect was I inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am a nobody. So Paul says, when it comes to apostles, is there anybody greater than Paul? No, by the way, uh, what does that tell you about the idea that Peter is the chief apostle and, th and that he's the guy who's going to become the pope? It's false because Paul says, I'm equal to him. I'm exactly like him. There, there, there's no difference between me or any other apostle. We're all exactly the same. It, it's it's kind of like, it's kinda like uh, me saying, what's the difference between me and Bill when it comes to being a Christian? Nothing. Not a thing. Right? Okay. 
He, he says, uh, was I inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I, I'm a nobody? The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. So Paul says, I even proved to you that I'm an apostle because I was doing miracles and signs and wonders that you saw, which, by the way, is the reason that we still today listen to Paul and we still today listen to the apostles because they're the ones that actually did real miracles. Not just people saying I've done a miracle, yeah. but other people look at it and go, I didn't see a miracle. You know, I, I, I saw, you know, somebody say they got better, but I didn't see anything. The kind of, the kind of miracles the apostles were doing were obvious uh, altering of natural law that proved that they were actually apostle. Paul says, I'm an apostle because I proved it to you by signs and wonders and the fact that God called him. And Ananias would be somebody who could verify that. In Hebrews chapter 2, where the writer is, is talking about the difference between the Old and the New Testament, and he says, speaking about uh, the Old, verse 3, he says, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Talking about the New Testament. After it was at first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. So the message of God was confirmed by those who heard. Now, how do, how do we know it was confirmed to us? Well, verse 4 says, God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders, and by various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. So what did the miracles, the signs, and the wonders do? They confirmed the word. They confirmed that the person was speaking from God. Okay? And that you need to be careful with today. Because I know there's some groups that run around saying they, they do miracles all the time. Uh, well, if that's the case, then you probably ought to look up to those people more than you do people who can't. Because apparently they have something that those people don't. If that's the way we're going to, that's where we're going to view things. Uh, but remember the difference between what a real miracle is in the Bible and what people claim today is a miracle. Uh, I believe God does miracles. Okay, don't misunderstand me. But I also believe that God is so powerful, he doesn't have to do a miracle to answer my prayers. Okay, so that, so that makes me therefore trust him by faith, not by sight or by some experience that, that I've seen. So Paul, Paul was definitely a true apostle even though they decided that maybe he wasn't. Now, the second thing that they would talk about Paul is that Paul was a man pleaser, okay? What's a, what's a man pleaser? It's like a yes man, right? It depends on who you're with. You'll say yes. If, if, you're, with, if you're with one guy, you'll say, oh yeah, whatever you want. If you're with somebody else who thinks something, oh yeah, whatever you want. And so Paul is, is, is a man pleaser, okay? He's somebody who's just trying to please men and maybe even make a reputation for himself, okay? That's kind, of, that's kind of what they were thinking about Paul, or that was one of the accusations against him. Because look at Galatians chapter 1, and down here at verse 10. Look at Galatians 1 verse 10. He says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were striving to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. You remember what Jesus accused the, the, uh, Sadducees, the Pharisees and the religious rulers of his day of doing? What do you accuse them of? Impressing the people. That's... That's what he says. he says. He says, they love to be seen by men. They broaden their phylacteries. They, they uh, lo lo love to say prayers in the synagogues in the open square. They, they love to tell people how religious they are. Because, and, and they seek out the chief seats when they go to parties. You know, how, how high can I be? That, that's what they're concerned about. And that's why in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, don't do your alms to be seen by people. And don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And that's one of the reasons why I have no idea if any of you give any money at all or how much you give. Because I don't want to know and it's none of my business. It's between you and God and maybe the, our treasurer who happens to know who, who might collect it. 
but it's not something that we run around telling everybody, you know, this is how much sister so-and-so gives and how come you don't give as much as her? Right, because God judges the heart. We're, we're, we're impressed with amounts. God's impressed with the heart, right? Okay, so they, they, they're probably accusing Paul of being a, a man pleaser. And part of why they're doing that you know, you might kind of understand when you read passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul is, of course, writing in here, and he's writing this section that deals with his use of liberty and his use of his right to do things, all right? And he comes down here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and beginning at verse 19, it says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might, so I may win the more. To a Jew, I became as a Jew, that I might win the Jew. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I may win those who are without law. Well, it sure sounds like Paul's a man pleaser. I mean, when he's with people who follow the law, he follows the law. When he's with people who don't follow the law, he doesn't follow the law. Sounds like he's, he's not concerned. He's not concerned about God. He's concerned about people. That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? Okay. But you have to understand that even when he's not following the law, he does say that he still is under the law of God. He's under the law of Christ. He says in, in, in uh, verse 21, he says, to those who are without law as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. So apparently, whatever this law of Christ is can be incorporated both into the Jewish and the Gentile communities. Whatever this law of Christ is. Not Judaism, but whatever the law of Christ is, can be incorporated whether you're, whether you're following the Old Testament or whether you're somebody who's a Gentile. And by the way, hasn't it struck you, uh, hasn't it kind of um, uh, caused you to think that as you read the New Testament, especially the book of Acts, and you see how the gospel's progressing, that you still had a bunch of people that would meet in the temple and they would offer sacrifices. They didn't, they didn't all of a sudden just stop offering sacrifices. And they didn't stop becoming Jewish. They didn't all of a sudden start you know, going out and having a, a BLT bacon party with their friends. Okay, they, they, they were still kosher, right? And they were doing it because that's the way they were brought up and they thought that's the way you respected God. And that was Peter's problem when uh, he had to go talk to Cornelius. And so God sent this Holy Spirit in a vision to tell him, Peter, you can kill and eat whatever you want. Peter goes, I've never had a BLT. <laughs> God says, you can have one now. Now, of course, it had nothing to do with BLTs, what it had to do with. With you can hang around Gentiles now. Gentiles are okay. Gentiles have never, ever been bad in the spiritual realm where God says, I don't want any Gentiles. You remember the promise given to Abraham? What's the promise to Abraham? All families, all nations. All families can be blessed. Well, the Jews thought, yeah, they can all be blessed by submitting to our rule. Yeah, yeah. Just like Democrats think, the, the United States is going to be blessed because they're under the Democratic Party. And the Republicans think, no, we need the Republican Party. That's going to bless America. No. You and I don't care which party is in power. I mean, we might have our preferences. But the person who blesses our country is who? God. God. He's the one that blesses our country. But what I want you to understand is, whatever the law of Christ is, whatever the law of Christ is, it's in the Jewish culture or the Gentile culture or communism or socialism 
You see, the law of Christ fits everywhere. Now, don't misunderstand me. That doesn't mean that everything under communism is in agreement with what God says. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is the gospel can fit into communism as long as you keep God's law. And yes, there's going to be conflict because there's conflict everywhere. There's even conflict in our country with our government. And we're supposed to have a Christian government, aren't we? But now our government says that, uh, Mike, if, if two homosexuals come to you, you're going to have to marry them. Sorry, I don't. I'm not, and I won't. Sure. Right. Right. Okay. But why is that? Is that because I, I hate uh, homosexuals? No. No, I love them. It's because I can't be engaged in sinful activity. Because I don't follow the, the United States of America. Who do we follow? God. So remember that whatever this law of Christ is, is what he's promoting. So even though he can be to the Jews, a Jew who decides not to eat meat, okay? My brother's a Sabbatarian, okay? Went to go, went to go visit my parents on, on, you know, this last month. And, and so my brother would come over. And so when my brother came over, my mom would make beans. Bet you can't figure out why we love beans. Make beans. And she would make one pot with bacon and another pot without. That's fine. I can go with or without bacon, right? You know, I can be like my brother is, you know, in order not to, not to offend him while I try to teach him and help him. And that's what Paul is saying about Jews. Or I can have a BLT with my neighbors. So what I want you to understand is, even though it looks kind of like Paul is kind of wishy-washy, one time he's with the Jewish community and then one time he's with the Gentile community, he is always under the law of God. He's always under the law of God. Yes. Well, that's why that last line of that I have become all things to all men that I might be all means to save. That's right. Because our goal is to save them. We don't care if you eat pork or don't eat pork. I don't care if you want to celebrate some special day. I, I don't care. Fine. You know, believe it or not, most of the world does not celebrate July the 4th. Okay. And they would also say that about Paul because when it came down to who he associated with, he hung around Gentiles in Acts chapter 11. In Acts chapter 11 and down here, verse 25, <clears throat> uh, it says, uh, this is talking about Barnabas. Barnabas established the church in Antioch in Acts chapter 11. And it says, and he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. Now, who's Saul? Paul says, that's his, that's his Hebrew, the, the Hebrew way he says his name. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught them con and, and taught considerable numbers and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And by the way, was Antioch a Jewish community or a Gentile community? It was Gentile. It's a Gentile community. And so no wonder some of these Judaizing teachers, some of these Judaizing teachers during this time over here, would look at Paul as being really unfit or at least not really qualified for you to listen to him because he's not really authentic. And so that's what you need to understand. But what we need to understand as we get into this is Paul's understanding of what it meant to be under the law of Christ. Let me give you a couple of passages in the book of Galatians since we're there. What does it mean to be in, uh, under Christ? In Galatians 5, Galatians 5 and verse 1. Here's what it says. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Why did we throw the tea off that boat in the Boston Tea Party? Why did we do that? 
because we didn't want somebody charging us taxes without our permission. See, we didn't mind paying taxes, but if they're just gonna raise taxes whenever they want, no, why? What were we looking for when we did that? Independence, freedom. We were looking for freedom. We wanna be free. So now we have a country that tells us when, and when you can wear a mask and when you can't. That's another subject. Don't get me started. But here's the point. The point is God called us to be free. Now, do you remember when God was talking to uh, Samuel and, and the children of Israel said to Samuel, we want a king? And Samuel goes to God and says, God, oh, they've rejected me. And God goes, no, Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They rejected me from being their king. Remember that? And God says, well, I'm going to go ahead and give them a king, but I want you to tell them what this king is going to do. What was the king going to do? Going to take your daughters and sons because he's mean? Because he's mean? Why is he going to take your sons and daughters? Because he's going to have dignitaries come into his house and he needs butlers and he needs maids and he needs cooks and he needs servants and he needs people and he's going to get them from you. And by the way, where's he getting his money? From you. And where's he getting his soldiers? From your sons. And where's he getting his cows he's going to eat and his sheep and his goats and all? Where's he getting that? From the farmer? From you. He's getting it from you. See, for some reason, Americans think that the government makes money. The government doesn't make money. The government spends your money. And in Jesus, what he wants is he wants us to be free. And by the way, that especially includes religious freedom. God doesn't want you saying, or, or God doesn't want you thinking, I have to go to a certain church that does a certain thing in a certain way. And if I don't go to that certain church, then I can't get to heaven. Well, then what am I tied to? Tied to that church. Well, that's why in our camp, they began to fight over different stuff. They began to fight over different stuff and about different things that were going on in the church and in the assembly. They began to fight and get smaller and smaller and smaller. And every time they got smaller, they said, we're the right group. And they got smaller again, we're the right group. And they got smaller again, we're the right group. And that's why there's certain different Baptist churches and there's different Methodist churches and there's different churches of Christ. Yeah. I don't want you to think that we're immune to that. That's what I'm trying to get, get you to understand. The gospel of God is designed to cause us to be free in Jesus. I, can't, I don't rule over you because I'm the uh, a preacher. I don't rule over you because uh, uh, Bill and I and Tiny don't rule over you because we're the elders. Now, we hope that because Tiny and Bill and I are elders that are supposed to lead the flock, that you see what we do so you can stay loyal to, G to Jesus the way we're trying to stay loyal to Jesus. Because that's, that's what we want. We don't want you to be loyal to us. We don't want you to be loyal to some church. We want you to be loyal to Jesus. That's one of the reasons why we don't, our camp, doesn't have a conference that we go to. So the preachers are told what they're supposed to believe. We don't have some council that makes rules and decisions for us so that we then come down and tell you what those decisions and rules are because you have to follow those decisions and rules. That would be Judaism or Church of Christism or Baptistism or what? Or Mormonism. Yeah, or, or any of those isms that you can think of. And we don't wanna be an ism we're just trying to be Christians. We're just trying to follow what Jesus says. And so therefore, there's some things we don't do. We don't call our preachers reverend because that makes people think that he's the big guy and you have to listen to him because after all, he's revered, right? Nope, in the scriptures, we're all the same. Yes. You call them what? Hyphenated, Hyphenated Christians. Hyphenated. Yeah, that's right. So. Uh, look at Galatians 5, verse 13. He says, for you were called to freedom. Somebody says, yes, I'm free. All right, I can do whatever I want. Well, let's see what he says. He says, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not use your freedom into a, 
uh, do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You cannot love someone if they force you to do it. That's why as parents, we need to be careful that when we talk to our kids, they're not just, they're not just doing what we're telling them to do because they know we're going to hit them and spank them. Now, I've, I spank my kids. Don't misunderstand me. But if you're spanking your kids so they're afraid of you because you're going to, you know, you're going to do that to them, then maybe you need to figure out a better way to handle stuff. <laughs> And by the way, there's other ways of trying to control control people. Some husbands try to control their, their wives by controlling the purse strings. Some wives try to control their husbands by holding back what their husbands need. And there's people who yell at each other to make sure that that person knows that they're going to get the wrath if they don't do what I say. You see, you have to understand that the gospel that Jesus gave us is meant to help us. It's meant to free us. It's meant for us to be free. But we live in a world that it wants us to be bound in slaves. Jesus called us to be free. And he wants us to be free. And we use our freedom as a way of loving somebody. And there's no greater freedom than when you personally decide to enslave yourself to another for their benefit. Right. And so it's one thing. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Spencer. They already had old things with us, but they want to go back to the old. That's right, especially in the book of Hebrews, too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's that's it. That's the way we that that that's ex that's exactly right. So freedom allows us to truly love, which is why God had that silly stinking tree in the Garden of Eden. People go, why did he stick a tree in there? If that tree wasn't in there, it would have solved the whole thing. No, it would have, would have forced them not to be able to choose to love him because there would have been nothing they could do to not love him. But when God said, don't eat of that, now they can choose. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Once he had that desire to be, you know, got to me on the side, like you said, at home. Right. Mm -hmm. no, that, that's exactly right. All right. And, and then uh, look at chapter two of Galatians and verse, verse uh, four, if you would, with me. Here's what people who aren't free try to do. Look at verse four. He says, but it was because of the false brethren, this is Galatians 2, 4, but it was because of false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus in order to bring us into bondage. Religion can be one of the most useful things for people who love to control other people. I don't want to control you. I want you to be free. I want you to be free, make your own decisions, free, free to decide your own things, to figure out what you think God teaches. Come to church if you want to come to church. If you don't think you need to come to church, don't come. Not, not going to, you know, bother me as far as, as the, my relationship with God. I mean, I wish everybody would come. But it's a question of what you want to do and whether you're going to be faithful to God or not. And so Bill and I and Tiny are usually here all the time because we think it's a good thing. We want to be examples for you to show up and be here and learn and listen. <clears throat> Chapter 4, verse 26. 
He says, but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. First Corinthians 10 and verse 29. First Corinthians 10, verse 29 says, I mean, not your own conscience, but the other man's, wait. Yeah, make sure I'm in the right spot here. Uh, I mean, not your own conscience, but the other man's, or why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? In other words, we have freedom, but we also need to understand that there's some people that don't have the same amount of freedom we have. So we have to be careful with it. But we have freedom. We're supposed to use our freedom the way God wants to. In 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2. <clears throat> and down here at verse 16. He says, act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as a bond slaves of God. So he called us to be free. So I can just do whatever I want. Yell fire in the middle of an assembly if I want. No, God wouldn't want me to do that. I'm free. I can therefore go sleep around with wherever I want. Well, I could. But God doesn't want me to. You see, we're free. But the question is, are we, are we worshiping freedom? Or are we worshiping Jesus? And that's why only in Jesus do we find what we really need. And that is freedom with personal limits that God sets up, not people. In verse 19. No, let me see. I think that's wrong. Yeah, it's supposed to be Second Peter. I forgot to put the Peter in there. Second Peter, chapter 2. And let's start at verse 18. He says, For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, talking about preachers, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the one who lives in error, promising them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. And the Judaizing teachers were enslaved to the principles of their law and their tradition instead of following Jesus. Isn't that, I think when I read this, I think of those preachers that are on television. Although they speak of good words, their hands out, you know, support me, support me, and they're rich beyond rich instead of giving back to their the ones they did. Kind of reminds us of Nicodemus. He had everything physical. He was rich. He was had influence. He was a teacher of Israel. He was keeping the right religion. He came from the right line. Jesus goes, you've got to be born again. Yes. Right, huh? Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So Simon the sorcerer was looking for something too when he saw the signs and wonders, right? And and some people want want those today because they think if you know if I can do miracles, I can make a lot of money. And there are people running around who are claiming to be able to do miracles and they make a lot of money. The only problem is, is I personally have never seen what I would call a real miracle performed by them, yeah. by those people. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, uh, one last thing, then we'll, then we'll end. And that is that some people believe that, he, that Paul learned his gospel, not his gospel was inspired to him, that he came to him. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11, Yep, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 11. This is going to occupy the first two chapters of Paul's book. He says, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men or man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So where does Paul say he got his gospel from? From Jesus, right? That, that, that's, where he, that's where he gets his gospel from. Now, why would they say that Paul uh, didn't have the real gospel? Well, one of the reasons is he, he wasn't one of the original 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And verse um, 6 through 9 says... After this, he talking about the resurrections of Jesus. After this, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And so the idea was, Paul says, I became an apostle late, so, therefore, he had to learn it from somebody. Somebody had to teach it to him. Yes, that's what they would say. Right. Yes. Cer certainly, certainly when, yeah, certainly when the Lord appeared to him, he was personally changed. You know, because it because it said he didn't eat, so so he's repenting, he's, he's mourning, so he was changed that way. But if you're talking about, you know, when he was able to preach, th that's that's when the Holy Spirit came on him, and so so he, so yeah, it's when the Holy Spirit came on him that he then was inspired by God. And, and that's what we have. As a matter of fact, I was going to go there. That's what we have in Acts chapter 9. And take a look at verse 19. Acts 9, 19 says, uh, right after he was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Now, for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately, he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is the son of God. Well, how in the world could all that old, not quite correct teaching, all of a sudden now he's teaching exactly what he should be teaching? And the answer is, because just like all the other apostles, the Holy Spirit was directing his mouth and telling him what to write and telling him what to say. Right. It was, he was being inspired by God. And, and that's why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and down here at verse 13, it says, For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as of the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. So Paul was saying, when, I, when I'm teaching you and preaching to you, it's not my opinion about what God says. It's the word of God. Now, when I say staff, that's my opinion about what the Word of God says. And so you have to be careful with it. But when Paul said it, it was the Word of God. And then the last scripture we want to look at is 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37. And in this context, Paul is speaking to the people who are misusing or abusing spiritual gifts during that time. And he says in First Corinthians, he said a number of things, like he to told him the order. He says, if somebody speaks in tongue, there's no prof, there's no interpreter, he should be quiet. Uh, th there shouldn't be people mumbling over each other or talking over each other. There shouldn't be disorder going on in the church. Now, in some major 
you know, Pentecostal groups, they have all that kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm just wanting you to be aware that some of that stuff goes on. I'm not, I'm not trying to condemn anything. I'm just simply telling you that it, that it even happens today. And so Paul addressed this letter for those kinds of things. Uh, and some people probably wouldn't like what he said. And so as he's writing to them, he says in verse 37, he says, if any man thinks he's a prophet, in other words, if, if he thinks he has the Holy Spirit and he's, you know, full of the Holy Spirit, he says, if any man thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandments. So if, so if I claim to have the Holy Spirit, but yet I'm speaking in tongues in church and there's no interpreter, and I say, oh, I don't believe what Paul said. Can understand what's going on in their own language. Sure. And in this one, it's saying, read in the Yeah, okay. Uh, but anyway, hold that thought. I need to finish that, but then we can leave. Uh, but the, the, the point I want you to understand is that some people would, would be bothered by what Paul wrote. And Paul is saying, well, if those people are bothered, it's because they really don't have the Holy Spirit. Because if they had the Holy Spirit, they'd recognize that what I'm telling them is what God wants. And so Paul isn't saying that you know, this is my opinion and I'm preaching to you like Mike preaches to you. Paul's going, no, I'm telling you what the word of God says. This is it. You don't, you, you don't have to go any further than what I'm telling you. So he was inspired by God. And uh, so those are the three different main objectives that they had against Paul as Paul writes in the book of Galatians. And if you understand that, it'll help you as you go through the book. Any other questions or thoughts before we end? Anything? All right, before we end, Pedro, would you like to lead us in a closing prayer? Yes, Albert. The church today, you know, some the true believing that some are um, of a different opinion. I don't know, like, but that aspect of the Bible to to realize Paul wrote about uh, how we should verse to tell some. I don't know how to really put it. Sure. Yeah, there was some question we make of that. But there was some question about hair covering and about attire and how you should. Dress and that they just cover the scriptures, and that's part of where the the the, the of Christ would come in for us to be patient and gracious with people who might see it different than we do, but yet the the idea of how they're saved, the the you know, trusting in Jesus. So, but that's a good question. We just don't have to cover right now. Okay, Brother Beth, would you come in? Lead us in a closing prayer. Would you, would you come stand over here so people can hear you, please? Yeah, we, we want them to hear you outside, too. That's great. Well, Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for let us be here today. We thank you for the things that we learned today. We ask the Lord to help us to retain that information and to have a very living for us and share it with others. We pray, Lord, for those who are here today. We pray uh, you be with them and whatever they need and be with them. We ask you to bring it back when they can. We ask the Lord to be with us as we live today and help us to be back next time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay.